which is never the same as having you all there, but just delighted uh, to have you with us today for what is a very special day um, and what a beautiful day it is. And I know we actually have uh, people from uh, the US and elsewhere in the world, not just Northern Ireland and UK. So I know it's a very early morning, a very early start for those of you, but here the sun's shining if it's still dark where you are. Um, we're 10 years ago, almost to the day, um, we started again very early on a beautiful morning in a packed house in the City Hotel in Derry where over 200 people uh, joined us for a, from all over Northern Ireland uh, for a breakfast conversation with Sir Ken Robinson. And uh, little did we think that a mere decade later we'd be facing, you know, a deadly global pandemic, uh, Brexit, climate change, the digital revolution, you know, this whole maelstrom of local and global challenges that have all driven every one of us literally home um, and made it, you know, unlocking creativity even more vital, if not existential. That's the big word for today. That's the one I would have stumbled on. Um, but it's for both our individual and societal well-being. So we thought that it would be really good to revisit um, Ken's work. And this morning, we're going to, to just do that. 20 years ago, um, I made an out of the blue phone call uh, to Ken. I was permanent secretary in the newly formed uh, culture, arts and leisure uh, decal, as it was known, the first ever uh, department for culture, arts and leisure, or as um, some uh, some people used to say, crack alcohol and laughter, crack being the, the humour. Um, but it was really um, a, a privilege uh, to take up this new post, but with a blank sheet. And uh, looking at Ken's, and I'll come back to how I got the All Our Futures, I was given All Our Futures by Noel, who'll speak to you later. Um, and I sat down that first weekend on the job and I read all our futures and I just suddenly thought, my goodness, um, this is the agenda for, for creativity, for culture, you know, for this new Good Friday Agreement, the devolved scenario we're in, the sense of hope and literally not knowing what to do or where to go. So I literally lifted the phone. Ken was in Warwick at the time in the business school. I rang him and I said, uh, explain the situation. And I said, would you help us? And he said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, I haven't a clue. And he said, of course. And so that was the my first encounter with Ken. Um, and it was there thereafter similar. And he did explain to me at a later point that he was used to saying um, yes to women from Northern Ireland as his wonderful wife, Terry, um, his lifelong mentor was from Newry. Um, so luckily for me, he said yes. And we actually embarked on a major exercise working across four government departments, education, enterprise, culture, um, and the and the, uh, health, to look at the possibilities of interdepartmental work and to unlock creativity. And literally it fundamentally shaped the approach and the policies to arts and cultural development, to enterprise and innovation and investment, um, the screen industry, and, and Marty will touch on this, I'm sure, later on, um, and creative approaches in education across Northern Ireland. It really was a golden time. And Ken worked with us over a period of four or five years um, to help us develop policies across party uh, and across departmentally. And then I, le I left him alone for a while, never, never totally. But 10 years later, made that phone call to say, we have won. Um, the inaugural UK City of Culture for Derry, Londonderry. Um, could you come and help us to make the, the best of our creativity in that year? And again, he said yes. In fact, uh, on a BBC interview, he, he made the point that he was going to get an app to block phone calls from me um, because it, it always meant work, but always work we enjoyed. Uh, he always brought such a humour to what he did. And with Ken then, um, you know, that year, uh, we were thrilled because um, he came, that was the first, that 10 years ago was the first time he addressed the city, but he worked with us uh, over a three-year period, um, inspiring, and, and that's what you're going to hear about today, inspiring us to be what we, all we could be as a city. Um, and really, um, it, well, what he was brilliant at was giving you the confidence and giving you the assurance that you were capable of anything. Uh, and by working together, you could get even more um, bang for your bucks. And, and the, the speakers are going to illustrate that, the panel, later on. Um, so we really are particularly honoured 
to be joined today by Ken's family. And when um, I first spoke with Kate and as Terry, Kate, his wonderful daughter, um, and they said, look, we'd love something. Uh, and Kate will explain to you what they're doing and his legacy and his memory. But he was so um, confident of the work in Northern Ireland and the fact that we landed, you know, especially in Derry as well, that Ken's work landed here. You know, you can write everything and you can report policy and here we took it and we did something tangible with it so it was a real honour for the family to ask us to reflect on that and today is that reflection um, that we can inspire us so much that we actually did something with it and we weren't alone there was other wonderful places such as Oklahoma and our very good friend Susan McCalmott um, who also um, Ken introduced uh, he kept saying to me, you need to meet this woman. He kept saying to Susan, you need to meet this woman. And we all both helped to share Ken's work, but make it tangible. Um, because he he was always there just motivating us and keeping keeping things going. So today is a really um, important time because his life work lives on in the hearts and minds of many. Those of us who were lucky enough to call him a friend, those of us who were lucky enough to meet and work with him, but even more importantly, those who are only now discovering Ken's work and finding their way with it. And that's global. That's right across the world. Um, you know, we're, we're really, we've enacted personally and um, developed all that he stood for. And it's an anchor, I think, today in a storm of chaos that's just around all of us. You know, it's within ourselves and the time and space has been, that has been created to find our element like never before. Um, things take time. I think we're starting to count in decades, though now time has slowed down more than I think it's ever had and ever had. The, the people here um, that we're working with are working harder than ever, I think. And yet we seem to be just caught in this, you know, bubble. And so how can we break out of that and use Ken inspiration to help us to do so and to do so for the better so without further ado I'm going to introduce um, for the next half an hour uh, Ken's um, film in his element that we recorded on that day um, uh, which we were delighted to be able to, to have um, it just shows you again a great decision at the time to record what he said and um, the slides that you'll see today are all quotations from his book, The Element, um, that hopefully act as an introduction to each of our panel. And we'll come to the panel after we've had a chance to watch Ken in action um, and just reminisce and reflect on all that he had to say. And his definition of the element is a place where things you love to do and the things you're good at come together. And I think that's what today's all about. So now I'm hoping that Paul will seamlessly move to the edited version of the film. They reckon by the mid 2020s, again, estimates of, of times vary, for a thousand pounds, you should be able to buy a computer that's got the same processing power as an adult human brain. In other words, you may find yourself at some point sitting in front of a computer that's as smart as you are. Not as attractive, you know, <laughs> not as in demand at the weekends, but as smart. Well, I mean, how's that going to feel? You know, when you give this thing an instruction and it hesitates and says, well, I don't know, you know, have, have you thought this through? I'm, I'm not sure you have. By 2050, for a thousand pounds, they reckon, we should be able to buy computers with the same processing power as the entire human race. This is the natural consequence of Moore's law, which is about the exponential growth in computing power. And my point is simply that from a technological point of view, all these gadgets that have revolutionized our world in the past 20 and the last 10 years are on the nursery slopes of the technological curve that we're now entering. By the middle of the century, it's like the entire planet will have been transformed even further by these technologies. Now, we've already seen the consequence of this for work, for the economy, for the pattern of global trade. From a technological point of view, there's no question 
that the world is going through a revolution which is comparable in scale to the Industrial Revolution. A big concern of mine, I work in education a lot, is that our education systems are still locked not in the 20th century, but in the 19th century. But it's not the only factor. The other big factor is population growth. Uh, there are currently, I think it's 6.8 billion people on the planet. That's more people on the planet at the same time than at any point in human history. For most of human history, we had about a billion people on the Earth, and we've now got nearly 7 billion. And half of those came around in the last 30 years. And this is a really interesting demographic shift to me, because in the old industrial economies like us, the population is declining. The real growth is in the emergent economies, and in the Middle East, for example, where something like 50% of the population is in their mid-20s or younger. So the whole world is tipping on its axis in terms of demography. But they reckon that if things continue as they are, we'll be heading to something like 9 billion people on the Earth by the middle of the century. 9 billion. There was a fantastic program the other week uh, by David Attenborough. I don't know if you saw it. It was actually last year. It was called How Many People Can Live on Earth? It's a really interesting program. And the basic premise is, at the moment, there are something like 145 children born every minute. That uh, adds up to 9,000 an hour and 200,000 a day. And they're all born with the same expectations. They want food and water and clothing and a life, like you do. The trouble is, there really isn't that much water or fuel or agricultural land available. So the question is, how, what's the maximum number we can handle on this planet? And I'll boil it down uh, so you don't have to watch the whole show. But the bottom line was that if everybody on Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, then the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion. But of course, we don't all consume at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda. If everybody on Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, it said, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.2 billion. And we're at 7 billion and counting. And people are figuring this out. And frankly, we only get away with it because they put up with it. And what we're beginning to see in the Middle East are people not putting up with it. So I think this is literally the case, that in our lifetimes, we will continue to see ever more radical changes in how the world is with itself and how it works. And it's why these initiatives are so important, not just for dairy, but more broadly. The second big theme is this. I believe myself that there is a kind of crisis, not just in the world's natural resources, but in our human resources, that most people have no idea what their talents are. I don't know if that's true of you. I mean, I wouldn't know. But what I do know is an awful lot of people go through their entire lives without ever discovering what they're good at, you know, if, or if they're good at anything. Um, an awful lot of people don't like the work they do, if they have work. You know, they just get through it and wait for the weekend. But I also meet people who love what they do and couldn't imagine doing anything else. And this is what this other book is about, this remarkable book, actually, <laughs> called The Element. You know, the expression is that, um, you know, if people are doing something they feel naturally attuned to, it's just a common expression, is that they're in their element. It's really two things, I think, to be in your element. And I believe getting people into their element is a key strategy for what would the challenges that we face. To be in your element is two things. The first is that you're doing something that you're naturally good at, that you have a feel for. Have you heard of a guy called Bart Connor? Have you? Bart Connor lives in Norman, Oklahoma. He's fantastic, I think. He's in his 40s now. When Bart was four, uh, sorry, when he was six, he discovered that he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. Now, we don't know how he found this out, but he did. And he said it wasn't much use to anybody, but it was socially distracting. You know, if there was a party at the house and the conversation lulled, 
his dad would say, Bart, do the hands thing there, and, you know, <laughs> and the whole thing would pick up again. And then he found he could walk up and down stairs on his hands, as easily as he could on his feet. Well, he said he didn't think much about this, but his mother did. And his mother, when he was eight, spoke to the school, and they arranged to take him to the local gymnastics center in Morton Grove, Illinois, which is where he lived. And he said he will never forget the feeling he had when he walked into this gymnasium. I said, what was it? He said it was intoxicating. I said, what do you mean? He said it was like uh, some, a mixture between Disneyland and Santa's Grotto. I said, how? He said, you know, there were wall bars, there were trampolines, uh, there were vaulting horses, ropes. He said it was intoxicating. Now, is that how you feel when you walk into a gymnasium? Is it? Looking around, I think not, frankly. I mean, <laughs> if I could speculate. See, I don't. I do not find it intoxicating to go into, into a gymnasium. In fact, I need to get intoxicated if I, <laughs> if, I, if I get within five minutes of a gymnasium. But Bart went uh, every day. And because he loved it. And 10 years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics, representing the United States in the male gymnastics squad. He went on to be the most decorated male gymnast in American history. He lives now in Norman, Oklahoma. He's married to Nadia Komenech. Do you remember Nadia Komenech, the first woman to get a perfect 10 in gymnastics? They have a wonderful little boy called Dylan after Bob Dylan. Why not Bob? We don't know. <laughs> it's what comes to spending your life upside down, probably, but anyway. <laughs> but, uh, he and Nadia run this amazing gymnastics center, and both of them are leading members of the World Special Olympics movement. So they've helped to liberate the gymnastic capabilities of tens of thousands of athletes with special needs. Now, the two things about this are, firstly, that of course what Bart discovered in early age was that he could do this thing. Uh, it was something that he had a natural aptitude for. And my conviction ha has been throughout my entire life that we all have deep natural aptitudes. And they're all different. There are things you're good at I couldn't even begin to do things I can probably do that you wouldn't be interested in doing, um, that there are, that if we know anything about human life, it's, it's that it's diverse. How many of you here have got two children? Can I ask you? Two children or more? Two or more? Well, I'll make you a bet. I'll make you a bet. If you've got two children, I bet you they're completely different, aren't they? I mean, you would never confuse them, would you? <laughs> Your two children. I mean, John will tell you, I'm, you know, we're two of seven, and we're all completely different. You know, we love each other, we love to be together, but we're completely different. That's the point, really. Human life is intensely diverse. And one of the points of diversity is our natural aptitudes, which differ enormously. One of the big problems with education is that we don't encourage diversity. We're obsessed with conformity. And we require people to be good at the same things. And some things in particular. And if they're not good at those things, they or we conclude they're just not good at things. And it may just be those things that, that they're not turned on by. So aptitude is a big piece of it. But it's more than aptitude. To be in your element, you have to be not just doing something you're good at. You have to love it. I know all kinds of people who are good at things they don't like doing. They just happen to be good at it. And they spend their lives doing this thing they're good at, not because they like it, but because they ended up doing it because they're good at it. To be in your element, you have to love it. One of my brothers, Ian, is, uh, has been in bands his entire life. He's now in a fantastic band called Rumors of Fleetwood Mac. They were actually played recently. I think it was the Odyssey, wasn't it? With the, uh, the orchestra and choir there. It's a fantastic man. Um, years ago, he was in a band in Liverpool. And they had this great keyboard player called Chaz. I, I went to see them. Um, I did not look then, by the way, as I look now. I was not the distinguished sophisticate that you see before you. I was into Led Zeppelin. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I was. I was channeling Robert Plant. 
at the time. I had the long hair, the leather jacket, and the jeans. I was almost frighteningly attractive, honestly, at this point, and, and a danger to women everywhere, honestly. It wasn't even a fair fight, really. It wasn't even fair. It's why so many of them avoided me, I think. As I, when I walked into ours, they would scatter. I could see they just weren't up for it. But this guy, Chaz, was fantastic. And I remember saying to him at the end, I went over at the gig, as we call it. Those of us who live at the leading edge of cool use language like this, you know, the, a gig. So we were gigging, and I went over to Chaz, and, and I said, you are fantastic tonight. He said, thank you very much. And uh, I said, you know, I'd love to do that. He said, do what? I said, you know, that, you know, play the keyboards like you play them. He said, no, you wouldn't. Well, I was taken aback, frankly, because I thought I would. And <laughs> in any case, I was just socializing. I wasn't... <laughs> wasn't there to be interrogated, you know, so I, so I persisted the way you do. I thought, I'm an expert in my opinion, so I'll just carry on with it. I said, well, I would. He said, you wouldn't. And we carried on in this way for some time until, until the barman intervened and said, would one of you move this forward? So I, I said, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, um, he said, I'm 25 now. I've been playing keyboards since I was five. And I play five hours a day. I practice five hours a day. And I play probably six nights a week. He said, and I do that because I love it. And I couldn't do it if I didn't love it. And he said, if you loved it, you'd be doing it. He said, I think what you mean is you like the idea of it. I said, don't you speak to me like this. I, mean, <laughs> I could be a distinguished person at some point. But of course, he's right. If I'd loved it, I'd be doing it. But that sense of passion when you're doing the thing that comes naturally to you and, and feels most authentic carries you through every type of obstacle. You can tell when people are in their element. One of the ways you can tell is your sense of time shifts. You know, if you're doing something that you don't enjoy much, five minutes can feel like an hour, can't it? But if you're doing something that you love, an hour feels like five minutes. Your whole subjective experience of time alters. And at the end of the week, you might be physically exhausted but spiritually uplifted by doing it. Whereas if you're doing things that, aren't, that don't resonate with you, you can feel physically OK, but spiritually depleted by the whole experience. And finding that point of resonance with your own authentic self, I believe, should be a quest for all of us. And we all have that sense of possibility, I believe. And it happens in every type of area. I, I met a woman on a plane once. I wasn't going to tell you this, but you know, it, it helps to talk. You know, <laughs> I don't normally talk to people on airplanes. I don't know if you do, Phil, or anybody else here does. I don't. Um, I, I don't like being trapped into a random conversation on an airplane. You know, particularly if it's a long haul flight, or even a medium haul, like a five hour flight. Don't talk to me. You know, I, I don't mind talking when we land. I don't. I mean, I'm quite happy to regret the five-hour conversation we didn't have. I'd rather that than regret the one we actually had, you know, for the whole five hours. I was on a flight a few, uh, couple of years ago to Hong Kong. And from Los Angeles, that's a 14-hour flight. And as I got on the plane, I sat next to this guy. And you know, you can tell when somebody wants to talk. You can feel it, can't you? People start fidgeting. You can feel them trying to find their opening line, you know, so you can bond. And I thought, don't do this. It's a 14-hour flight. I don't want to talk to you. Anyway, I was wondering what his opening line was going to be. And I sat in there. And at the plane, they hadn't even closed the door of the aircraft. People were still loading up. And he t anyway, the killer line eventually came out. He turned to me, and he said, so, you going to Hong Kong? <laughs> I said, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, that's why I'm on the Hong Kong flight. This is the, in fact, we're all going to Hong Kong, all of us. It's <laughs> so the one thing that brings us together at a common purpose. Uh, interesting to get to Hong Kong. Talk to them. There are 500 of them. Go and talk to one of them. Anyway, I got my book out. I was reading Moby Dick. Somebody has to do this stuff. So I sat reading Moby Dick. I thought, that will deter him. Anyway, two minutes later, he said, so, you're reading Moby Dick? I said, yes. So I went to the toilet. It's the longest I've ever spent in a toilet, actually. 14 hours it was altogether. <laughs> but, 
But I did finish Moby Dick. Anyway, this, I got chatting to this woman as we were landing in, uh, on a flight into Florida. Uh, she's a beautiful woman, in her 40s, I should think. I, I, you know, I didn't know what she did. I imagine she was probably in the fashion business, just the way she looked. But uh, anyway, it turns out she's a professional pool player. Her name is Ava Lawrence. She has a website. She's called The Striking Viking. And when she, she was raised in Sweden, north of Stockholm, and when she was 12, she followed her brother into a local pool hall, and she said she was captivated by it. And she went on to practice there every night, uh, a bit like Bart at his gym. She became the regional, then the, the national, then the regional champion. And she eventually moved to New York, where she's based now, and entered the world championships. This is over the course of the next five or six years. She spent her entire life playing pool. She does master classes, demonstrations. She started the first women's league in pool. And she said she finds the whole game entrancing, still, 25 years later. And she said, what interested her is that at school, the thing she disliked most of all was geometry. She couldn't get her head around geometry. But she said, whenever I stand at the pool table, all I see is geometry. You know, it's all about angles and uh, uh, cutting off corners. And, and she said, every time the balls reconfigure, it's a whole new geometric puzzle. She said, she now uses pool to teach kids geometry. But she says, and that's why I'm mentioning it, she said that even now, all these years later, she doesn't know if she's at the pool table, if she's been there for three hours or 20 minutes. She gets so lost in what she's doing. And you know that. Uh, if you get in touch with a process that speaks to you, your whole sense of being is transformed by it. I don't, I don't mean in some whimsical sense. I, th I mean, actually, you go into a different place with it. And I think our kids give us signals like this all the time, all the time. Uh, and you gave your parents signals, too, things you were naturally drawn to, things that spoke to you. The thing about this, the reason I'm telling you about these the Bart, Connor, and Ava story is this. It also illustrates something else that's very important, I think, for this process here, which is that our lives are not linear. I think this is fundamentally important to recognize, is that life is not linear. It's organic. And I say this because most of our institutions are designed on the premise that life is linear. Schooling is, isn't it? Now, the idea is if you go right through the normal process and pop out the far end, you know, suitably qualified, uh, you'll be on track for the rest of your life. This has never been true. I don't know if you're doing with your life now what you thought you'd be doing when you were at school, are you? I mean, I'm, I'm not. You know, I didn't think at school, if it all worked out well, one day I'd be hanging out here in Derry with you, you know, kind of talking about this project. <laughs> life doesn't go that way. My son has just been, uh, has been at the University of Southern California. And when he started there, we were given a briefing by one of the, uh, the professors, the parents were. And he talked about his own son, who'd been at USC. I think he left 10 years before. And he said, when his son started at USC, uh, he wanted to major, as they say in America, in, uh, in the classics. And he said, my wife and I are a bit worried about this. Because we thought, what type of a job will he ever get with a classics degree? And anyway, he did classics for the first year. And he said, we were a bit relieved when at the end of the first year, he came home and said that he decided not to do classics. He said, you know, mum, dad, I don't know how to do classics. They said, why? He said, I don't think it's going to be much use. He said, no, OK, great. He said, uh, I think I'll do something that's more useful. He said, what's that? He said, philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, we pointed out that none of the big philosophy firms were hiring at the moment, you know, like, like conceptual ink, you know. And he said, anyway, he did philosophy for another year, but he finally majored in art history. And he said, if I tell you that now he's working for an international auction house, he travels the world, he spends his time with people he really likes to be with, he loves the work he does, and he makes great money, um, and he got the job because of his knowledge of art history, his immersion in classical culture, and the intellectual training he got from his philosophy programs. He said he was ideally suited for it. And it's that series of disciplines that made him look for that sort of role. 
He said, you know, but if we'd said to him going in that, uh, you know, here's the deal. Why don't you do classics, art, history, and philosophy? And you never know. Ten years from now, there may be an opening in an auction house, you know, and you'll be ideally positioned for it. See, it doesn't happen that way. What happens is if you invest in your talent or your children's talent or the talents of people you work with, they create opportunities that would previously have been hidden from them, that actually even weren't there. And that's the whole creative process. That's how cultures work, that you create possibilities that previously weren't available. And then you live in those possibilities and create new ones. You know, Bart Connor, for example, seems to me a great example of this. His mother could have said to Bart Connor when he was eight, Bart, will you stop it with the hands thing? <laughs> like, we get it. You can do it, but the joke's over now. You know, get on with what you're meant to be doing. But she didn't. She encouraged him. And in doing that, he took the first steps, albeit on his hands, into a life that nobody could have predicted. And this is the point. His mother, though she encouraged him, could not have foreseen the life that she was opening up for him, could she? There's no way she could have thought, you know, here's Bart, he can do this hands thing. You know, there's this girl in Romania, you know, and I have a Bob Dylan album. You know, you never know. <laughs> this could work. That's not how it works. You create your life. You compose your own life, and then you live in that composition. And you can recompose it and recreate it. That's the point. Because if we know anything about human beings, our essential gift is the gift of creative possibilities, the gift of imagination. So there's a revolution. I believe we ha can only meet this by thinking better of our own abilities and those of the people we work with, of our children. And the third point is, to do that, we have to create the conditions under which talent shows itself and will flourish. And that's not a mechanical process, that's an organic process. This whole city of culture process will unleash possibilities that nobody here, none of us sitting in this room, can imagine. I'm helping to um, support and mentor a similar process in the state of Oklahoma. Oklahoma is the youngest state in the American Union, and the first 100 years of its statehood really depended on its, on its natural resource in the ground, its oil and the great agricultural resource of the state. They know that they won't sustain them into the future, that for the future, the real resources of Oklahoma are the people. And what they are finding, by the way, is that many young people are leaving the state because they can't see a future in the state. So what we're trying to do with the Oklahoma Creativity Project is to create a new sense of possibility for the people living there. I've also connected Oklahoma to this international network of creative states that I mentioned earlier. And I think that's a possibility here, by the way, for Derry. There's a huge opportunity, I think, for Derry, London, Derry in this international framework. But what Oklahoma's finding, I remember I spoke to the governor about this, and he said, you know, if we have this statewide program, you know, where will all the ideas come from? And my conviction has always been they will come from everywhere. If you're a creative leader, your job is not to have all the ideas. Your job is to create the conditions under which everybody has ideas, and they will come from everywhere. One of the things that's happened in Oklahoma now is that they've created a school of contemporary music, a rock school, essentially, modeled on the Brit School. And that would not have happened. There are now 600 students at this school. That would not have happened if this project hadn't been there, but nobody foresaw that as a possible outcome. That's been true of the city of culture in Liverpool. All kinds of things have come from that that nobody thought when they put the original planning doc documents together would actually happen. I live uh, not far from uh, Las Vegas. H who's been to Las Vegas? Have you been to the Venetian Hotel? You should go to the Venetian Hotel. The Venetian Hotel is a replica of Venice. It's uh, on the first floor, there's uh, a, a replica of St. Marco Square. There, there's a canal that's inside the hotel. Uh, gondolas and gondoliers. I have been to Venice. And the Venetian is better. <laughs> it is. It's, it's more authentic, I feel. And, <laughs> and it doesn't smell. Anyway, we went there uh, a while ago. Uh, uh, Terry, my wife, and I, I should have said this earlier, probably, actually. I mean, I've had a long association with Northern Ireland. My, Terry's family are all from Northern Ireland. And Aidan McGinley and I worked together 10 years ago on the Unlocking Creativity strategy. So I, I'm a frequent flyer to Northern Ireland. I've, I haven't just popped in. I'm, I'm here a lot. 
But uh, so Terry and I, uh, we've been together now for 33 years. I mean, can you blame her? <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, let's be serious here. Terry is a major fan of Elvis Presley. Uh, actually, that's a bit of an understatement. There are three of us in this marriage, honestly. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm alive, you know, but it's a kind of marginal, <laughs> marginal advantage. Anyway, five years ago is our silver wedding anniversary, so we went to Las Vegas to get married again at the Elvis Chapel. It was great. It was her idea. <laughs> she, <laughs> she wanted to be near him on this day of days, you know, and I, and I went along with her. Anyway, we had the Blue Hawaii package. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but there are others. There are others. Uh, but the Blue Hawaii package, you get the Elvis impersonator, Adrian. Four songs out of a possible six. Uh, a hula girl. That was optional. I opted for it for <laughs> reasons I was rather pleased about in the event. <clears throat> Who knew coconuts were so versatile? I had no idea. But, um, and smoke. That was the fourth bullet point. Smoke. That was on. <laughs> and I was looking for it, you know, in the middle of taking my vows. I thought, where's my smoke? <laughs> we've, we've, we've paid for it. And just when we got to I Do, there was this puff of smoke from an exhaust pipe just above the altar. It was lovely. <laughs> for another $100, we could have had a pink Cadillac. But we thought that was a bit tacky. You know, <laughs> we, we thought that was lowering the tone of the whole occasion, frankly. But... Anyway, I mention it for all kinds of reasons, but one of them is this, that if you think of it, there is no reason for Las Vegas to be there. Have you ever been there? You know, there is a reason that Derry is here. We were saying this at dinner last night. There's a reason that Liverpool is where it, where it is. It's a natural harbor. Oklahoma City is in a great agricultural plain. You know, Chester is in a place of natural defense. Most cities, ancient cities, are there for some strategic reason, as an advantage to the place. Uh, none of this is true of Las Vegas. Las Vegas is in the middle of nowhere. It's a desert. There's no natural water supply. The place is full of scorpions. Nobody would think of putting a, a city there. And yet, for a number of years, it was the fastest growing city in America, and it's one of the most famous cities in the world. The only reason that accounts for it is that Las Vegas represents something that is unique to human beings. There are something like Vegas that only human beings are really capable of. Actually, that's true of a number of things about Las Vegas. Uh, so I'm not talking about pole dancing, for example. Although it is true, only human beings seem to pole dance, don't they? Have you noticed this? Other species do not pole dance. They don't. And you can't train them to do it, by the way. You cannot teach your dog to pole dance. Just take my word for that, would you? <laughs> it's, a, it's a waste of a weekend, frankly. I, I wish it would never bother. No, what I mean is, the power of imagination. Las Vegas is an idea, really, and it's, it's an idea that has proved tremendously fertile, and people have been drawn to it. If you think of it, almost everything that's distinctive about human beings comes from this power of imagination, the ability to bring to mind things that aren't present. And from that flows all the extraordinary capabilities of creative work. Creativity is not the same thing as imagination. Creativity is putting your imagination to work. It's applying your imagination. There are lots of misconceptions about creativity. One is that only special people are creative. Actually, we all have deep and profound creative abilities. The trick is to nurture them and evolve them. Another is that creativity is about special things like the arts. Well, you know, I'm an unapologetic advocate for the arts, particularly in schools. But you can be creative at anything, at maths, at engineering, at architecture, anything that involves your intelligence. And the third misconception about creativity is there's nothing you can do about it. You're creative or you're not. And actually, there's a lot you can do to make people more creative. And it's from that source of creative possibility that we produce this rich tapestry of human culture, the, the values and forms of behavior that distinguish different communities. So creativity and culture are intimately connected. Human culture is the outcome of these capacities. But it's about the conditions. And I have seen in the work I've done the past 20 years, whole communities transformed. Phil will tell you about communities in Liverpool which have been transformed by giving them a new sense of possibility. Not far 
from Las Vegas is a place called Death Valley. Death Valley is the driest place in America. Nothing grows there because it doesn't rain. In the winter of 2004, it rained. Seven inches of rain fell on Death Valley. And in the spring of 2005, there was a phenomenon. The whole floor of Death Valley was carpeted in flowers. You can see this online if you Google it. Um, Death Valley became a pasture for several weeks. Well, what it showed was that Death Valley isn't dead. It's dormant. Right beneath the surface are these seeds of possibility, waiting for the right conditions to come. And if the conditions are right, life is inevitable. That's how it is with organic processes. If the conditions are right, life will come. And if the conditions are wrong, life will hunker down. And it's exactly the same way with human ecosystems as it is with plants or any other natural ecosystem. Communities, if they are deprived of the right conditions, will hunker down and become hostile to themselves. If the conditions are right, people flourish differently. And I believe that that's what this whole city of culture process is about. Culture is an organic term. You can't predict the outcome, but you can create the conditions under which growth will happen. And then you have to see what you can do with the things that begin to emerge. But I believe this profoundly in all the work I've ever done in schools, with businesses, with the cultural sector, that if you invest in people's sense of talent and creativity and give them the tools and a sense of possibility, extraordinary things will begin to happen. And it always happens, and it's inevitable that it will begin to happen. The thing is, this revolution I'm talking about is essentially unpredictable in its outcome. And it's unpredictable because life is organic. It's not linear. I don't believe we can predict the future. There are some things we can predict. I mean, we know when Halley's Comet's coming back. We know when the next high tide's going to be. But in the world of human affairs, very little is predictable. We can't predict the future, but we can help to shape it. We can anticipate it, and we can help to bring it into being. And I think if we get this process right here in Derry, if you get this process right in Derry, if you invest properly in the creative possibilities of the people, the children, the people of all generations here, you will create a sense of possibility here that at the moment is unforeseeable, but its outcomes will be fundamental. You will, I think, begin to see a harvest of creative work and creative achievement that you can't plan for, but whose riches eventually the whole city will benefit from. Thank you. Well, wasn't that just wonderful? Uh, everybody, I mean, I think Ken is as relevant now as he was um, 10 years ago. So many of us have just lived through that. I mean, it's, it's, it's like it was yesterday. And there was so many thoughts there. You know, he basically, the, the whole thing about time and about physical, our physical and spiritual authentic selves, about... You know, if you're doing a job that isn't, what is it, the, the old adage is uh, for people who, um, if you do a job you love, you never work a day in your life. Um, it, it's that sort of sense of um, being in touch with that process. And for me, you know, his point about you create a, your life, uh, you compose it and you live it, but you can also recompose it. And I think that's the point in time that we're at um, today. Um, what we wanted to do was literally bring these um, thoughts of Ken's together again. And we're already, thank you, we're already getting um, feedback on the chat box, which is vital. So we'll get a chance at the end of the panelists speaking to feed in some of the thoughts and ideas that are coming through. Um, this is about shared vision and about if you bring people together, uh, the power of that and, and reconnecting with that. Um, Ken always highlighted that creativity was found, you know, in individuals, it's found in schools, it's found in communities, found in organizations, and that, you know, it's also about culture, commerce, and education. And that's, that's how we've shaped the next part of this morning for you and the panelists that we've invited along today, um, because they have actually all it what struck me when I was listening to Ken again and and having read as you can see a very well thumbed version 
of the element. Um, this is my book, which Ken signed that day, actually, though I had had it for a while. Um, but all of our panelists actually are in their element. Um, they might deny it. They might deny it when they start to speak. But I, I do believe that what you're going to witness today are, um, you know, the, 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 well, hopefully we're still waiting on Phil to join us. Um, but hopefully, you know, Marty, Jennifer, Noel, John, uh, and Phil have actually got to a point in their lives that they've listened to that message and have found their element, which is why they can speak so eloquently about it to you. Um, what we want to do is celebrate Ken's life and work because um, it deserves the legacy that uh, we could all benefit from. We want to reflect on the lessons we've learned. Um, you know, that point he made uh, about we're at a moment in time and indeed time's not linear, that sometimes when you're doing something for five minutes, you discover it's, it's five hours if it's something that you're enjoying doing. But that element about reflection um, we want to also look back, take the opportunity, because we're, this is the 10th anniversary of us being uh, designated Derry as the London Derry as the UK uh, inaugural uh, city of culture. Uh, that was a phenomenal um, ambition. Uh, that was where, uh, you know, like minded people did come together and say, we have nothing to lose with us. And, um, you know, that was one of the reasons why uh, Phil was here. I'm still I still don't think we. We have Phil on online, do we? No, we might have trouble connecting with him. We might have to do the running order, order slightly differently. Um, but then finally, we're asking each of the panelists, which is what I want your help as the audience as well, to imagine if, uh, and that's the call to imagine if, that's what Ken's family are putting out. And Kate will explain to us later um, about the legacy that um, we want to take forward, imagine if. Um, and, and, you know, because anything is actually possible, um, these applied insights and learnings um, to the, just the unprecedented challenges and opportunities that we face today in this uh, global, never mind local, and individual challenge um, is something that, you know, we need all the help we can get. So I'm going to actually already change the running order, um, if people don't mind because we're, we're waiting on Phil to come in. He must be having difficulty connecting. And I'll come back to Sir Phil Redmond, um, who was the leader of the panel that, that selected Derry. Um, and I know you'll want to hear from Phil. And maybe what we should do is actually, John, um, to divvy you up and bring you forward. This shows the live nature of this event. <laughs> um, but I, I'm delighted that John Kelpie who is the chief executive of uh, Derry City and Sudan. Hello. Yes, thank you. J Paul, who is my wonder man on the, on the digital, has already rescheduled here. So John um, is the chief executive of uh, Derry City and Sudan District Council from the outset of the council when local government reorganised back uh, to April 2015, when we went from 26 councils down to 11. And John has managed and steered strategically that change, um, which was, was a big challenge for um, the city because the city is now associated with my home place, um, Straban. So you were bringing a lot of urban and rural together um, and melding all of that. And uh, the council built uh, a lot on the previous work done um, and the one plan which I was privileged to be um, involved in as well, but have created a, a fantastically ambitious strategic growth plan for the city from 2017 to 2032, which is going to involve over 10 years an investment of £3.6 billion, um, pounds, which is phenomenal. And I know John will share uh, some of the, um, the impact uh, of what we have done over the last 10 years uh, with us um, and how we've built on it and indeed what the, the county, the county of the city and all the surrounding district addressing those economic, environmental and social well-being issues. Um, and the thing that I think is most laudable about the strategic growth plan is that it's it's targeted on um, poverty, social exclusion and disadvantage. So it's very much a living uh, and breathing uh, plan. So John, without further ado, we've used the um, quote from the element, which is very much about how we can visit the past 
we can contemplate the present and anticipate the future. But the most important and profound thing is we can create. And I know what you're going to share with us today is a little bit of the thinking of what happened before and what is coming through now. Thanks a million. John, over to you and we'll come back to Phil. Well, thanks very much, Aideen, and good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, the joys of uh, working from home. Uh, my son is, uh, has just been making scrambled eggs and set the fire alarm off um, <clears throat> while Ken was speaking. So if the alarm goes off, it's uh, don't worry. I think I've muted myself there. So um, anyway, as I was saying, if the fire alarm goes off, stay where you are. It's me who's in trouble, uh, not yourselves. So I suppose back in, in, in 2011, um, when, when Ken was speaking there, there was real momentum building in the city. There was, there was a real sense of, of possibility in the air. Um, I was really pleased and, and lucky to be part of it all. Um, but I would say that's, that's been something that's, that's happened roughly every 10 years or so uh, in the city over the last couple of decades. In the early 90s, there was the beginnings of the, of the signs of the peace process and people felt that we were starting to come out from, from under a huge rock. In the late 90s and early 90s, the Good Friday Agreement, I think Aideen mentioned this earlier, um, the, the peace process, the, you know, the millennium was upon us, things started to seem possible and it, it began to feel real for the first time. There was no, there was no going back. Um, by 2010, 2011, ambitions had risen. We were planning and we were strategizing for the future. We were on a very new trajectory and we were beginning to work together. We were visioning together. We were strategizing together and we were dreaming of what the city um, could and should look like and, and how we would live in the next couple of decades. And I suppose for the first time, um, taking Sir Ken's words there, we were in our element in, in Derry, London, Derry. Back in back at that time in 2011, we were we were doing something we were really good at, something that Derry people are really good at is talking about Derry, planning for the future of Derry, and and even more importantly, we were beginning to show how everybody else to everybody else how good Derry was. So we were we were ready to tell that new story, and one of hope, of ambition and creativity, and that's what we set out to achieve in 2013. And that's what we did in 2013. And we were really good at it. Um, we discovered that we had a deep natural aptitude for working together on major projects of going the extra mile, of creating and problem solving, of finding innovative solutions, of being hosts. And, and we really enjoyed it. And we know that because so many people got involved, so many people became immersed in it. Um, it washed over us at the time, like, like a huge wave, and it, and it was over in a flash. And that warm glow, I would say, is still with us today. Um, in the years after, it's in the early years after, we obsessed about legacy and the lasting benefit. We, we evaluated it and we measured it. And, and yes, we were relieved to see that many of the metrics were good. Um, tourism expenditure in 2011 was 29 million pounds. By the time we got to 2013, with all of our events, it was 47 million pounds, and it rose to, to 71 million pounds in, in 2019. And there was a huge amount of physical transformation, obviously. I mean, the city transformed hugely physically. The Peace Bridge, the Guildhall was refurbished, the riverfront opened up for the first time. Ebrington was beginning to blossom, St. Collins Park um, became refurbished and we used the city in a whole different way. We took back ownership of it and families took back ownership of it at night time especially. But more importantly, for me, the genie was out of the bottle at that stage. We always knew we could do it and for once we had really, really proved it. But we were hungry for more and we wanted to go even further. And so having developed the one plan in 2011, we came together again in 2015. We were renewed and referred. Mm -hmm. 
for inclusive economic, environmental and social growth um, and well-being for the city and district for the next 10 to 15 years. This time round, we really were in our element. Our resilience, which had been so depleted during the decades of the Troubles, had been replenished by the year of 2013, had been replenished by the confidence that that gave us. And although we didn't know it then, we would need it for the next few years, because the next few years have been pretty rough, pretty bumpy. There was big restrictions on money, big restrictions on budgets. We lived through a few years of austerity and we had to tighten our belts and monies to do great things and realize great ambitions were no longer there. There was huge political change locally. Here we had, as Aidan has said, the two councils merging, a shift in dynamic politically in terms of how the region um, was managed. And in Northern Ireland terms, of course, we had the collapse of the executive and three years without any government. And of course, bang in the middle of all of that came Brexit. And all of a sudden, particularly here, particularly in this cross-border location, it felt as if it felt as if the world was closing back in again. It felt as if having opened their horizons, they were again being limited. And, and of course, in the last year or so, we've had COVID. But all the while, all during that period, we continued to plan. We kept our eyes firmly on that distant shore and we knew we could reach it. And with our new confidence and still in our element, I would say, um, when it felt like things were closing in again, we pushed back and we expanded our horizons. We reignited relationships in London, in Dublin, in Europe and the US. We reconnected with our diaspora. We formed a new strategic partnership with, with neighbours in Donegal. We established trade links in China, in Philadelphia, in New York and in Boston. And we worked together and we pushed really hard to advance her plans. And this week, on Wednesday of this week, almost 10 years on exactly from Sir Ken's presentation in March 2011, we will sign a heads of terms agreement with the UK government and the Northern Ireland executive on a city deal funding package of over 250 million pounds of investment. The largest city deal per head of population ever secured in the UK, the single biggest ever investment in the city and district. We'll build a new medical school with that. We'll create and build three new centers of world-class innovation excellence and in data analytics and in artificial intelligence and robotics and in health and life, life sciences. We'll undertake two massive regeneration projects along the riverfront and the city center of Derry and in the town center of Straban and we will build new tourism projects and greatly enhance the wall city. And on top of all of that, we're investing over 70 million in parallel in community projects right across all of our neighborhoods and right across the city and district. So in my opinion, the next 10 year wave now begins. The new story that we developed over the last 10 years gets more exciting, even more exciting. It's a real page turner. You can't actually put it down in my view. Imagine if, well, imagine if every young person who feels despondent, who feels there is no hope, who feels disconnected, knew this story, felt part of it, creates the next chapter, makes it their own, and we're in their element. Thank you. John, that was just beautiful, um, a, a really compelling, uh, especially your what if. Um, I mean, and that's what I think we want to get out of today. And if, if people listening in in the chat box give us their what ifs, um, I think we've got a real agenda going forward. But that whole idea of a new story of when we were formulating a new story 10 years ago and now there's, that story is continuing, as you say, um, and that young people feel part of that story. That's fabulous. And, you know, in one way, Phil, I'm delighted that you've now joined us because it's probably good that you got to hear what John had to say. 
um, because I know that you were going to start this. Um, we were delighted, um, uh, delighted beyond the word. We were gobsmacked, elated, um, totally energized. Um, I, I never forget, I don't think a lot of people in the city and indeed in Northern Ireland, it was such a moment because um, Derry had just come through the whole Cameron um, mm. apology and you know so many things had happened and this was sort of that uh, what John just described you know that point in time where the city would know always knew it could do something but this proved that it was possible and then to get that sense from John of the progress many of you will know of Phil um he probably doesn't even need a real introduction um but Ken in his speech had talked about creative leaders and that creative leaders don't have to have all the ideas but they they create the conditions where everyone will create those ideas. And Phil just personifies that. Um, he uh, has been the Mr. Uh, City of Culture since his early days when he was involved in Liverpool. Um, as he would say, still, and I think he's right, imagine, Phil, I'm agreeing with you, but Liverpool was the most successful European capital of culture ever. And he'll, he'll tell you a little bit about that. But in terms of creativity, the quote we've chosen for this section is creativity is a process of having original ideas that have value. And Phil just personifies that. Um, I mean, he's well known for his television work for um, uh, drama series such as Grange Hill, Brookside, and even through to the day, um, Hollyoaks. And indeed, I remember the excitement when Hollyoaks came to, to Derry, Londonderry for a week during City of Culture, my goodness, um, talk about putting us literally on the map. And indeed, small things, I know that Phil, when Hull won uh, UK City of Culture, uh, the following year it was the second city, and Phil managed to persuade, and I was in his presence at the time, Tony Hall of the BBC to put Hull on the weather map. Um, and it's these small things um, that people with imagination like Phil can create that difference. Um, he also um, shares with Ken um, a, a passion as an advocate and ambassador for his home city. I know they have many rivalries in terms of football, which will remain unspoken, but uh, Liverpool, uh, he is Mr. Liverpool personified. And again, too, I was honoured to be present when he was given the freedom of the city of Liverpool by his own city. Um, but he has just so many strings to his bow. But today, to hear from him, for him to come back, 10 years almost to the day um, when he introduced Ken that morning and now he's back to tell us 10 years later um, what, where we are, where we've been, where we are, but hopefully imagine if where we could go. Phil, over to you. Mute. Well, you mute. Um, that's a hell of a build up, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> It's probably not the best day, actually, yeah, Dean, to, uh, to bring in the football references. I've not managed to beat Liverpool for the first time in three centuries yesterday. Um, however, and funnily enough, one of the things Ken and I used to joke about was the fact that he was, an, he was actually an Evertonian, you know. And I worked out that his, his, obviously his time spent thinking about creativity and culture was that he, he never had to think about football, you know. But that was just a kind of, you know, whatever. But I just want to touch on three things today, really, which is that uh, obviously just touch on UK city culture. I also want to talk about why Derry uh, a little bit and then the big question on why culture matters. And I think it's, uh, if you don't mind, before I do, I just want to reflect on a couple of things that Ken uh, made in the speech. And he, he said then, and uh, I think John picked up that 10-year that, that theme I mean, Ken said something, he felt that something of global significance was happening at that time. And I think he was right. And the problem, with it, the problem is that when you live through periods of, of global significance or epochs or whatever, you don't actually appreciate it at the time. You need these type of events to look back, you know. So, and I think a, a 10 year cycle is quite good. He did make the point about education, culture, and commerce. And I'll, I'll be talking about that later on. He referenced uh, Las Vegas coming into life and the Blue Man Group coming out of one person's ideas like Mercy Television came out of my head. And above all, I think the point he made is that creativity is the application of our imagination. And I think that's what we mean by culture and how we all come together, all everything we do together. And I wonder what he would be 
reflecting now on what's happened over this past year with this sort of global display of the way educational knowledge and culture and commerce has come together to fight the pandemic, you know, and I think, and that's something we will probably reflect more on in 10 years time. But for any, any city thinking about moving forward, bringing those three things together, you know, sort of education, culture and commerce is, is so important, you know. And he also talked about, he used the uh, Death Valley thing about dormant seeds beneath the surface and blooming in the right conditions. So anyway, we, we sort of got on a lot because we shared those same notions. So I just wanted to reflect on that. But the, one thing that always puzzled me from that speech, and someone might be able to tell me off, off camera at some stage is he started off by making the point that he was up at 5 a.m you know and as he was at dinner the night before I was wondering why he was up at 5 a.m that morning or whether he'd actually not gone to bed you know so but anyway it's just the kind of thing that sort of like hangs away so UK city of culture well the purpose of the city of culture is to as it's always been is to provide one city with a a media spotlight. It's, a, it's for one city to be in the focus of the UK's attention. And, and that is so it can sort of, you know, present itself to the world and actually remind itself of who, who it actually is. And it's still the same. It's to help others do what we did in Liverpool in, in 2008. And that was not create thousands of jobs, you know, because one of the big things I say every, every time we, we do the, the round is, trying to persuade the politicians to not to overpromise on jobs and infrastructure, you know, because, and I know funding is often tied to that, you know, the, 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 that's the only way you get funding, you have to promise these outcomes. But the real, real legacy of being UK city culture is to rediscover who you are, you know, and is to remind everybody in the city why that city is actually there, why it, why it functions where it was, where it is, and where it, where it wants to be in the future. And that's what happened to Liverpool in 2008. We, we got the spring back in our step. And although we had a fantastic year and everything was, was great, what was left behind was the collective confidence and ambition to do what our forebears had done, I suppose, is go down to the shores and look out to the world and not stand with our backs to the water thinking everybody was against us. And I really do now, that's my main mantra when I'm talking to every city who's thinking of going for the award, which is that it, you know, your legacy will be leaving behind the ambition and optimism in your young people. And it's those young people who have, the, have a great year and they see things they might not have seen before and they experience things they might not have uh, even thought about experience. But within that year, you get permission to try different things. And I think that's what the Ken's point about Death Valley is. It, that year allows the, the rain to fall on those dormant seeds of creativity and imagination. And it happens 10 years later because it's the 14 to 16 age band and it's the 21s to 23s. As they come up 10 years later, they start to get into positions that are actually where they can make it happen, whether it's in commerce, whether it's in education, whether it's in culture or whether it's in, you know, in politics. And I think that's the premise that you need to think about UK city culture. Um, at, you know, and the bottom line is define your own culture and define what step change you want to achieve through that culture. And that applies when you're actually going for the award, but it, you have to keep that in mind as you move forward, and particularly as you get to this 10 year uh, period. And that takes me to a worldwide dairy. Well, Again, at the time, it was like Derry was one of four we were looking at. And, you know, to be honest, it was kind of like, it was a long way away. <laughs> so, so it had to be, I mean, the, the proposition had to, had, to, had to really work. But I have to, again, with hindsight and everything now, and I can be more you know, forth, forthcoming on it, when these, uh, when these lines of Seamus Heaney were, were read on the on the bid document. It, it seems so obvious, you know, that those five lines, you know, talking about, you know, rhyme and, you know, yeah. and also the line about, you know, history rhyming, you know, it's just, um, it just seemed to be, you know, the moment. And I think, uh, uh, again, thinking about that, that 
2013 was one of those moments, I think, the once in a lifetime moment, you know, when helping history ran. And I think it was what, what Ken would say, Derry at that point was in its element, you know, and the verdict of the South Inquiry came out while you were actually bidding in Liverpool, you know, and that all those kind of things came in. It, it, and I actually, you yeah, have to say to Martin McGuinness, it didn't have any, that didn't have any bearing on it to be, to be honest, but it was all part of that great wave of what was moving and just made it so obvious it must hit that city. But then at the same time, it was um, what you did with it, what you did with that year, unlocking the cultural code, bringing the communities together across the divide, that really laid down the template for what would come next, what would come for the future UK city career. Bringing those communities together, highlighting the sons and daughters and the talents of the sons and daughters, and how each city then could actually take that view and look at its own talents. Of course, you know, the template was, I suppose, was set out by Liverpool, but, you know, we sometimes have to step back and say, well, we, we do have an advantage being the creative centre of the universe. And, you know, but we knew that the, the Scouts Arati were one of the things that actually sort of won that European bid for us, you know, whether it was, you know, you know whether it was the local towns or whether it was the people like the Beatles or wherever. But what you did there was, again, take the sons and daughters and put them on the stage and right across and show to every city, every city has got this pool of talent to call on. And that pool of talent then becomes a yardstick for the next generations to come on. 2017, Hull saw that and they, and they raised the bar by also bringing in uh, global uh, culture to a city like Hull, where we in Liverpool, the great joke was that they were the city at the other end of the M62, but when you went there, it was like the road to Hull and back, you know, and that was the kind of, that was the kind of joke. But actually then Hull suddenly rediscovered why it was there. And everybody else we really discovered that Hull was a destination as well, that, that, that Hull could go to it. Hull didn't quite manage to, to be honest, Hull didn't quite manage to engage the communities as well as you guys did in Derry. But from Hull, we moved on there. And what we did there is establish the fact that legacy was so important. And I went back and read your legacy plan <laughs> over the weekend, which was fantastic. It was brilliant. And again, um, I listened to John and I could read between some of the lines there about the way legacy is only, you know, viable if you still got the resources to do it. And so Hull set out to set up the legacy company to actually take on the legacy as well as, as the culture company delivered the year. But I, again, I don't think that's been successful, but Coventry, I think, has actually we moved on to 2021 actually has taken the, the experiences uh, of both their predecessors and they made legacy, uh, partly because we nudged them to it, they made legacy part of the delivery. So the people who are delivering will be delivering the legacy too, you know. And they are really, they really embraced your point about bringing all their communities together, you know. Um, so I think you've got, you know, it, you, you can look back to 2013 and see that you've set the template and we'll be soon moving forward to 2025 and then 2020 and 2029. But the other thing that Coventry did, which again, it comes back to, to uh, Ken, and I think it's, if you're thinking anybody moving forward, education, culture, commerce. Now what Coventry has done is integrated business. In, they integrated business into their bid and they integrated it into delivery and they've integrated it into their legacy strategy. And it's really important because it's something I've always said that commerce or business is always closest to the public. And that means they're closest to the voters. And it means that they're usually ahead of the trends or the feeling or the opinion of the public ahead of our policymakers because the public are their staff, their customers and their clients and business has to respond to what they want and what they need. And what businesses also want is a thriving economy, obviously, you know, and that can only come from a, a thriving community. So each is reflective of where and where, uh, where and when they are. And I used to talk, talk about architecture, the fact that you get the architects that you can afford at any one time. And it's the same with culture. You know, you get it 
you get the culture what you can afford and it's not about money and most of the time it's about people coming together to try and create things and business will support it because business and culture is a, is a symbiotic relationship but what they want what business wants is to do things on their own doorstep you know gone are the days when business could be seen as a whole as a uh, a hole in the wall where people could go and get sponsorship because it was a good thing. You know, business is, is not like that anymore. You know, business wants to see things happening on their in their community, on their doorstep, and they will actually take part. You know, and you know because they've all learned the metrics now. You know that you know, uh, you know that everybody comes. Everybody who comes out to see an event has to eat. Everybody who comes out to, to attend an event shops. Everybody uses transport. Everybody uses their phones. Everybody uses this kind of thing. So it's the that's a great thing to keep in mind all the time. So from UK City of Culture point of view, that, that's a fantastic legacy that you passed on. <laughs> and by making a success of the year and show how communities can come together and everything. But of course, you then have this real thing about, well, that's great for everybody else, you know, but you know what, you know, what's in it for us? Or you know, what's still in it for us, kind of thing. And I think that, you know, being first, you know often sort of shows everybody else the way, but perhaps you don't actually think you've got the real benefits of it, you know? So you have to try and think, how can we do that? But what Liverpool did is after 2008, we had the same thing. I mean, we had that feeling of like, oh God, thank God that's over, you know, take a breath, see what we can do next. But then we saw, you know, our 2008, we saw the way uh, City of Culture came through. We saw what you guys had done in Derry. You saw what was coming up and all around. And I remember talking to the city and saying, you know, you know we, we, we set everybody off on the road to this and we need to make more of it, you know. And so in 2018, we rebranded it as the 10th anniversary and it didn't, it didn't bring a lot of more investment or a lot more cash. But for that next generation coming through, it was the 10th anniversary of when they'd had a fantastic time. And we got a bump in the city of that time. And... The big thing that happened and we started to focus a lot more on was the fact that, you know, all these things, you know, when you're talking about investment in culture, you need to get the policymakers on board and people at Treasury and people in town halls, they like data, you know, and it's also very well saying, yeah, 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 that's great, that is fantastic, you laid the template and all these other cities have got on with it. So that brings us to what I think that, that question is why culture matters. Well, in uh, Liverpool's case, 10 years on, you know, the destination economy doubled from, from 2 billion to over 4 billion pounds. Mm. And in that time, uh, mythical grants from the European Union was 100 million pounds a year. So culture, you know, and building on the back of culture, put an extra 2 billion pounds into the economy. To the, to the extent that last year, 49% of all business rates came from culture mm. in one form or another. You know, so when people ask in Liverpool, well, well culture is also very well. So, but well, my question, my answer to them now is, yeah, culture is, all, is so very well and it's doing very well. What about the other 51%? You know, isn't it, you know? So, you know, that's, that is the hard fact that, you know, by attracting more and more people to the city, it does have the economic benefit. But there are other, there are other aspects of it too. And I go back to uh, the time uh, when I was going in and out the city in 2013. And towards the end of the year, when I got a lift out to the airport by a taxi driver, and I said to him, I said, well, you know, and I'll use a technical term here. I said to him, well, never, never mind all the bullshit. He said, I said, what do you think about all this, you know, city of culture here? And he turned around to me and said, well, Mr. Remley, he said, I'm in my 50s and this is the most peaceful year of my life, you know. And to me, that's what I think is the value of culture, you know. And I don't know whether you've ever done the metrics or analysed on what the peace benefit of that, of that year actually was, you know. But you know, that's the kind of thing. And so the next time we hear that refrain, you know, culture is also very well, but, you know, the other thing I say to my local uh, politicians here, and I say to the ministers when we're talking about UK city culture is, well, to me, you know, this thing about culture is also very well, but frontline services first, 
Well, actually, culture is the frontline service, you know, and that's what Ken was getting at, you know, when you're talking about the, all the three things being mixed, education, culture, comment. Because to win minds and hearts, to win the support of the people, you know, to bring about any change, you have to have a strong cultural connection, you know, and that's why I think that culture is the frontline service. And it's no, it's no coincidence that those lines from Heaney have echoed down the ages. It was like Bill Clinton used them in 1991 on his visit, didn't he? And Biden used them in his in the inaugural address. Because, you know, the question now is where is, and John touched on this in his 10 years, where is the farthest shore? For 2023, I think, it'll be your 10th anniversary. And that's a look, time to look back and manage the myth of, of legendary, you know. <laughs> And it won't take a lot of money, you know, but it doesn't take a lot to give people to permission to come up with their own ideas, you know, and host their own reminiscences and celebrations. But that 10th anniversary will also bring back the media spotlight. It will also give you the attention, you know, and to remarket the city again. And so if you can, if you can do that, you know, if you can get people to look back at their own highlights and think about how they can create their own events to celebrate that. Find the biz businesses or commercial partners to come in behind it, you know. I think you'll, I think you'll probably have something to work with, you know. Um, and it worked for us in 2018, quite simply. So, you know, I think, I think you should do it. And media loves anniversaries. So once you have that environment and you create it, it's up to everyone else to decide what to do with it, you know. That's again one of the things Ken was talking about, you know, to create that environment to allow people's imaginations and creativity to flourish, you know. So, again, you know, I'll, I'll throw out the challenge to you again, you know, define your own culture, you know, and then decide what next step change you want to achieve by that and use the 10th of energy. You've done it before, you know, the Liverpool's doubled its destination economy, and you can do, you can do it all again, you know. And the other line from Ken's speech, I think, just to end with is really, you know, you can't predict the outcomes, but you can create the conditions for possibilities, you know. And I think that's great. And you may not, you know, you may know, going back to this, you may no longer need to believe in the miracles and healing wells, you know, but you can still reach for that fair to shore, you know, so that, that's what I'd say to you all. <laughs> Well, as always, um, it just reminded me of old times um, and, you know, how you can come and inspire and, um, you know, it's, it's so many of the things there. You've actually given me a really lovely transition over to, to Jen, which I'll do shortly. But just to thank you, I mean, one of you, the point you're making too about the change and about the measurement for peace. And in the chat box, we have a wonderful example um, of the uh, BANS forum and the work that was done across the community where the, you know, a common platform, I would encourage people to look at the chat box to see that example. Um, it, it's, it's a brilliant one where it, it, it really did create a, a different place in the city um, that is the envy of a lot of other parts of Northern Ireland. And it's, it's in the times we're in, it's, it's all the more important that we create the conditions. and. What, what John was saying, you know, about uh, being a page turner. Um, I, I think you've set, set that scene. Derry, um, I think tourism grew by about 41, 42%. And in a, in a separate study, you were asking the point about evidence, which is true. Um, I think it was something like 82, 84% of the city, of people in the city said how proud they were to be of the city uh, 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 as a result of city of culture. So you're, you're quite right about getting the tangibles. And I thought the point about business and how business is close to the public, sometimes people don't think of it that way. In fact, if anything, they think that business isn't. Um, and business needs to thrive in communities and a thrive, to have a thriving economy. And that leads me perfectly into, into presenting now Jen, uh, Jennifer Neff. Sorry, Jen, I, I'll always call you Jen. Jen, I had the privilege of working with Jen 10 years ago. Um, and Jennifer's one of those, that decade that Phil mentioned um, of, of entrepreneurs. Again, a thing that struck me about what he said there about the next generation that, you know, the 14-year-olds then or the 24-year-olds now. Jen, I'm not going to ask you your age, I promise. But, you know, Jen was a young woman um, 
working um, in the community when she first heard Ken speak. Um, she, along with her co-founder, Eliane Monk Olsko, it just has created a wonderful digital for good company in Derry called Elemental, based on the fact that she herself was so inspired by what she heard from Ken and that her award winning company is now named after him. And what her and Leanne are doing is embedding social prescribing and putting um, creative approaches into the delivery of well-being programs right here, not just in Northern Ireland, but across the UK, which is exemplary. Indeed, she herself um, uh, was uh, a TED speaker in the past and voted uh, Maserati. Maserati. Is that right? I probably pronounced that wrong, Jen. But one of the top 100 entrepreneurs in the UK in 2018. Um, and she works a lot with young innovators, uh, responsible programs in Dubai, et cetera. But the, the most important thing is that I think the quote here that um, for this section sums up what, what Jennifer's doing with Leanne. Um, as a young, um, very successful business in the city, that finding the elements is essential to a balanced and fulfilled life, hence the social prescribing and well-being focus of our company, but also to help us understand how, who we really are. So now over to Jen to give us a perspective on what it's like to be a, a, young, a young and really inspiring entrepreneur. I don't feel that young, not today anyway. Um, I get the coat off. It's a bit cold in here. I've come into the office. So we're just at the Guildhall um, and I've come into the office because of the wall behind because it's really, really important as, as part of the story. Um, so thank you, Aiden. Yeah, so Leanne and I, we came up with an idea in 2013. And as part of the, the program for 2013, there was a, a, a team ed health challenge. And it was like, if you come up with an idea that's going to improve health and well-being, you know, pitch your idea and and tell everybody about it and if you won you could win 500 pounds and it would be a great start so so Leanne and I had um we'd come up with this idea but be before I tell you what that idea was it's 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 not a coincidence that it's elemental software it's the company's actually called a new element and um I was in the audience that day and um, I listened so much to what Ken had said. And I met people that I'd never met before. I remember who I was sitting beside, but I think what the most important thing was, I remember how I was feeling at that time, because there was a, a digital revolution that had started in the city at that time. There really was a strong sense of community as well. Everything that was happening around city culture, it was, we people would talk about, you know, if this isn't engaging, some of the most socially deprived uh, neighborhoods in our city, if they don't feel touched by this, we've failed. So that message was loud and 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 and, um, and clear. The leadership in the city at the time too was something that we'd never seen before. And if I was honest, we, I don't think we've seen since, but it was great. It was just, you know, everyone was coming together. There was that willingness to partner together, put your egos to the side and, and like just look at how we could make things better. Um, and it was the first time, I suppose, ever in my life that I felt that anything really was possible. So I bought Sir Ken's book and he signed it for me. And I told him that I was yet to find my passion because I knew there was something uh, out there still for me to do. And when I look back at my own education, you know, I wasn't, I wouldn't have been the, the, the grade A students. I don't even think I was the the grade B, it was more around the, the C's and I had a bit of a knockback when I did the A-levels. I got two D's and an E and I'd, I'd worked so hard for it. And I remember thinking, what an under God am I going to do now? I'm not going to get in anywhere. I knew I wanted to go because I did really want to go. And Derry at that time was, you know, was just, I knew that wasn't enough for me. So I knew I needed to go somewhere else. And I had to go and go through what's called clearing, phoning around places to see if they would take me in with my crappy grades. Luckily, I managed to get in um, to, to a college in Edinburgh, and I thought, right, I'll never let that happen again. So armed with that, I just I always remember thinking, right, I'm going to have to work hard at this. I'm, you know, I'm going to have to come up with ideas and solutions, make things happen, make a difference, because uh, I knew the grades weren't ever going to be the thing that was going to get me there. But little did I know that uh, that day, listening to Sir Ken, that it would make the impact on, on my life, because shortly after that, uh, Leanne and I got chatting. Leanne was the program manager in one of the healthy living centres up in Craigan. And Leanne and I got chatting about, God, there's so many things for people to do. You know, the, the year of culture was happening. There was 
there was all sorts of things being planned. Um, but yet we were still living in a time of health inequalities where depending on where someone lived, they would actually, their life expectancy was affected by 15 years. And Leanne and I were thinking, God, this is not right, you know, in this day and age that this is the case. So we got chatting, to, went out and chatted to a couple of communities and a couple of groups of people. And they were saying, oh, I didn't know there was free swimming around the corner uh, on a Tuesday. Or I didn't know that that was happening. And then other people said, I didn't know that was happening, but I just don't have the confidence to attend that type of thing because people like me don't go to that type of thing. So we knew what we needed to do. We knew we wanted to connect people into their communities more. And we knew that the difference it would make because if people are connected in their communities, they're happier, they're healthier and it improves their quality of life. So Leanne and I said, look, what would, wonder what would happen if we actually saw what digital could do here. We knew that face-to-face -face was the most important thing, but we knew that digital could play a role in, in doing this. So this is where we came to the TMED Health Challenge and we said, you know, we want to help people find their passion. We want the, them to be in their element. You know, thinking back to what Sir Ken had said. So then we stood up and we, we pitched our idea. We got t-shirts printed with the wee logos and everything. And this was like, this was a big moment for us, but unfortunately we didn't win. But the person who won that competition that night was a guy called Professor Morris Mulvena from Ulster University. And he came up to us after and he said, your idea is actually better than mine. I'm going to give you the 500 pounds that I've won. So we got started on 500 pounds and, and that was it. And that's all we needed really. It was just a bit of a jump start, and it was someone believing in us. And I think, what happened around that time in the city there was lots of people there who were prepared to listen to us and people that were saying that sounds I don't exactly know what you're trying to do but it sounds like you've got something good going so all we needed was a wee bit of motivation and a wee bit of support so Leanne and I then started to look at getting this this thing built because we weren't techies which is and it still amazes me to this day when we won things like small tech company of the year it's like I look at her and I say she says it's mad and we, we're not even techies we wouldn't even, we don't even know how to code um, but we have a fantastic team who do, thankfully. So uh, we were just charged with all the positivity and everything that was happening at the time. Um, we've actually developed a platform that GPs and social workers and community paramedics can use to make a referral for someone. So if they meet someone and they think, right, this person would actually benefit from tying in with an art class or dancing or maybe debt advice or social welfare legal advice or being connected into a food bank and, and it, they can make referrals using elemental to what's known as a social prescriber so there's lots of these social prescribers they're like community navigators they're community developers they're, they're social prescribing link workers and they use elemental now to sit down with someone find out what they're passionate about find out what's important to them and then say well look let's have a look and see what's happening in your local neighborhood that we could connect you into. Because despite everything, there's still lots and lots of things for people to be able to do. And the only thing I suppose that's changed with the whole COVID side of things is that it's a, a lot of the stuff now is a lifeline for people. So be it the food bank, be it the befriending support, be it someone that's going to get the groceries. Um, so that's what Elemental does. But the, one of the best things about it is it, it provides this data for commissioners to be able to say, well, look, street by street these are the issues that are affecting these people in these streets this is the types of services that are available here's where the gaps are here's the difference that it's making to a person's well-being here's the difference it's making to the community and here's the difference it's making to the health and social care sector so we're connecting the whole thing up together so fast forward now to 2021 we're here in the office and look i'll just turn this now Oh, let's see if I can get it this way. Look whose face is up there. He was so important to us that we made sure that he was going to be on our wall. This is our wall that tells our story. Um, he's also out at the printer as well. I'm not sure what he would think about that, but um, his quote is up there just for everybody when they're doing a bit of printing, they can look up and be inspired by him. We have 30 people in our team here. We have an office, our headquarters is in Derry. We have an office in the People's Republic of Merseyside um, as well. Um, we're growing all the time. We have two new jobs out at the moment. There's another one going out later this week. Um, 75,000 people are benefiting from being connected in their communities via Elemental. And this, this is honestly just blows us away to think about it. But we, are, we just don't want anyone to be left behind. We want to create an environment where... The, and we moved to the city centre, I mean, just as the pandemic was happening, and I've, we've no regrets of that, Leanne, and I said, it's important for us to have, you know, people in the city centre working, living, buying their lunches, things like that, so we've no regrets of that, trying to get a bit of a rent reduction from the landlord, but 
we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's just we owe it, we really do owe it all um, to City Culture, to Digital Dairy, to Sir Ken. I had a message from one of the team there that's based over in Durham and she said, good luck today. I know how important this is to you and how important Sir Ken has been to you and Leanne. So, and she was wishing me good luck. So yeah, it's just, it's great to be able to tell our story. We want to show people that anything is possible. Literally, we were sitting in that audience and we heard what he said and we took it into our hearts and we've made a, a like, a, although we've made a business out of it, we've, we're creating opportunities for people and we're showing people that, you know, anything is possible. So thank you. Yeah, and I don't need to say any more. You just personify it. You just take it, run with it, and you know, look at the good you're doing. And just to say to you, we're running tight on time here, but the chat box is so rich. Um, we've had Stoke on Trent, Phil, and um Paisley, who have both commented that it was even though they were unsuccessful, how inspired they were by you and Ken and by the process and how both cities have progressed. Stoke's still making art from dirt and Paisley have just won a major award in Scotland. So isn't it wonderful? Just that's the people who are watching in today and that's the impact we're having. So uh, because of time, I'm gonna march on quickly to the next person, Martin Malarkey or Marty as he's best known. And he's, he's he, he would never say anything good about himself. That's the kind of him, but Marty was the, the inspiring founder of the Nerve Centre in Derry, which is must be a, a, an institution by now. Um, and it, it was this point about mutual inspiration. I remember, as I said to him, visiting him many years ago uh, for grants. Um, and there were a guitar collective, a group of musicians who came together. And out of that, I've created the most wonderful model of creativity that I could suggest to anyone. Um, and he'll talk to you himself about the creative learning centers and all the work that came out of it. And most importantly, Martin was a senior programmer for the community and education within the team that delivered Derry City of Culture in 2013. So Marty, without any further acknowledgement other than how wonderful you are, over to you. Sorry, I didn't have to always remember to switch myself on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to say a few words, really, because obviously <laughs> what Phil and John and Jennifer, of course, have said about the city of culture, in a sense, uh, you know, speaks volumes anyway. I mean, I suppose, first of all, I want to say, really, that uh, what, what Karen, I suppose, identified for me, really, in, in his speech and a lot of his writings is, is, the, is the role of the creative maverick. You know, and a lot of people over the years have sort of said, how did you manage to get the nerve centre started in Derry or how did you manage to get so far, you know, particularly in the, in the 80s, you know, when the, when the place was so depressed and, you know, like as I, I suppose a young person growing up in Derry, I didn't see any hope, I didn't see sort of any future for, for anybody because we were in the middle of a war, obviously, and the city centre was devastated and, you know, I, I grew up in, in, in the Chantal estate, you know, um, but um, but lo and behold, you know, when I was about 15, a certain band came to play in our community centre, uh, the Undertones. Um, a few weeks later, they were on top of the pops. And for me, I suppose that just sort of triggered, I suppose, the beginning of of, 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 of what my life kind of turned into. If, if, a, if a dairy band, you, you know, could actually write so, write songs, you know, when they weren't writing about the troubles or anything, they were complete escapists, sort of a, 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 a band. Um, but uh, two of them were going out with girls in my street they would, get the, they would get the local bus when they were on top of the pops and I could never understand this, uh, the idea of, of people on top of the pops who would be getting the same bus as you. You know, you're sitting up the back of the bus and they're at the front of the bus. And I remember saying this to, to, to Mickey Bradley years later, you know, that this, that this was a major mystery of my life, you know, as a teenager, you know, <laughs> how you would be getting the bus. Fergal Sharkey was also our TV repairman. So anyway, I'm only reflecting on this because um, a, a young uh, girl actually in her 20s now is actually writing um, a dissertation about that whole sort of scene, you know, and, and, and how, how, you know, uh, to some extent it defined Derry as a place where you could do maverick and crazy sort of things. Um, and in some ways, like in a sense, anything I've ever been involved in has all been because of, 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 of punk rock, you know, and what was going on in sort of Derry and the uh, in the late seventies, so fa kind of fast forward, I suppose, really to today. And I mean, if you, if you look around, not just Derry, but the, the whole of Northern Ireland, I mean, uh, with Fulls just said there about culture being on the front line. I mean, you, you know, the, the creative industries in Northern Ireland actually are Northern Ireland now because obviously one of the major ways we've come out 
of you know of 30 years of conflict as they've sort of switched on uh, the creative spark and in that sort of sense what what what, what Ken is talking about there is is a monumental kind of um uh, insight into a society you know that has sort of in a sense completely turned itself around to the point where people come around the world you know to come and visit these fantasy landscapes of, of Game of Thrones which I always felt was very ironic you know, to some extent that um, you know Game of Thrones actually in some ways is another metaphor for the troubles <laughs> because it's about people you know um, at daggers drawn and uh, betraying one another and all sorts of and here we have now uh, you know the, the, the landscape of, of the the troubles is now a fantasy sort of landscape um, where people, you know, they go to Iceland as well too, but I've, 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 you know, I've met people who've come from Iceland and then landed in Belfast and, uh, you know, the, the idea, like the notion 30 years ago that, you, you know, that something like this would ever happen, um, you know, in a sense, it does sort of, a, I suppose it does bring out to the fact that you can dream, you know, and sometimes these kind of weird dreams can actually you know, come to pass. Uh, um, so in that, in that sort of a sense, I suppose, uh, you know, I, I'd like to probably talk more about what's sort of going on across the country, really, you know, uh, um, and whether or not that's anything to do with dairy being a sort of an engine that can then drive out. I mean, the nerve centre has a centre in Belfast, and I happen to have been working there for the last four years. I've met a lot of really uh, creative um, community workers who are working on the ground in loyalist communities, actually, um, much more so even the nationalist communities. Um, and for me, that's been a, a bit of an inspiration because um, uh, uh, in a sense that one of my uh, tasks in the city of culture was to sort of bridge the divide and be involved with the, the unionist and loyalist community and bring them into the heart of the sort of program. And what I discovered really was that they were <laughs> they, they, they were more connected to the notion of a UK city of culture, obviously, than most people because they saw it as a celebration of their culture and, um, and they were completely enthusiastic and, and, and infectious and uh, and in some ways the city of culture certainly this idea of trying to break through the divisions of Northern Ireland there was no doubt about that you know during the city of culture that that that, that was one of the major uh, um, you know achievements of it um, and they think that that could still go on you know across Northern Ireland um, um, and in some of the most deprived communities I'm talking about communities like Rathcool um, you know, which would feel, I suppose, um, uh, abandoned and, uh, you know, very high levels of not just deprivation, but sort of underachievement by young working class Protestants. The fact that, uh, you know, creativity is actually uh, budding and uh, the Death Valley stuff, you know, um, applies to them as well, too, that in the midst of where they think, well, there's no, there's nothing here for us just like we, we, as we felt in Derry in the sort of 80s. So history repeats itself in a sense, and, and sort of in a sense, you, you know, you, you hope that um, uh, the, the same transformation that's kind of has gone on in Derry, it's gone on in communities and throughout the city, can go on through the whole of Northern Ireland. The other thing I wanted to really just mention really, and I know Noel's going to talk about this, so I'm not going to that um, in any great detail, but um, this whole notion of a creative economy now in Northern Ireland, you know, where you've got companies in Derry like Dog Ears, who are, you know, they've got uh, animated series on Netflix where we've been, where we've been watched globally. Um, you know, obviously Derry Girls has put the city on the map and a, and a, and a sort of the humour of the city on the map in a way as well too. But just the notion that, you know, uh, Dog Ears' work, for example, is translated into 17 different languages. So, the, so their little animated series of a puff and rock, you know, has been watched, you know, by millions of people in China, um, uh, you know, and, and obviously, uh, 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 you, you know, the notion that something like that would have come out of the city um, and reach so many sort of people and reach into sort of the lives of so many young children, you know, because I've seen a lot of the posts that, um, that uh, you know, parents put up as well too, you know, because obviously on Facebook and Instagram, you can put a lot of stuff up. And, and, and the way in which that series connects with young children, I think it's kind of kind of inspirational. Um, but uh, uh, for me, the future of that very much depends on what's going on in the schools, you know, and this is where I'd like to sort of suppose, just bring it back to Ken as well too, because I do want to mention the, 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 the Ken Ramson Awards that the Nerve Center has been lucky enough to be able to set up with the support of Northern Ireland Screen and the, uh, Department of Communities, you know, it's only a, a sort of a pilot scheme at the moment um, and, and the winners will be announced, I think, at the event uh, in early March. Um, but just to be able to actually acknowledge the legacy of Ken in that small way that he has inspired so many people in the schools, so many educators, 
um, so many people have realized that if you don't get digital culture and digital creativity into the classroom and get it uh, uh, you know, functioning to, at the highest level, and then you're connecting outside the classroom then, which obviously is what we've seen in COVID, that if you, do, if you, don't, if you don't have that infrastructure, if you don't have the ability, you know, if, if kids don't have iPads and don't have um, um, uh, digital devices, um, um, so they can be learning well beyond uh, the classroom, in a sense, uh, you know, it, I mean, uh, you're, you're going to fail people at the most sort of fundamental sort of human level. Um, so, uh, so the creativity in the, just in the classroom in Northern Ireland, like I've, I've once again been fortunate to be involved in setting up qualifications for filmmaking in schools, seeing young people make, make their own sort of individual short films. That got, that's got them a high place in university. That's actually one of the, one of these young people actually went and, and entered his film um, in Texas in a film festival in Texas that had an award for the young aspiring filmmakers, and he won the same award that Steven Spielberg won. Uh, um, uh, you know, you know when he when, when he was eighteen. Uh, uh, um, you know, so just I suppose that sense of confidence that we can give people uh, um, um, in their schools. Um, and uh, for me, I suppose, in a sense, that that would be the backbone of everything. You know, of course, it's about business. It's, it's about a creative economy. It's about the creative industries leading Northern Ireland, you know, into the future. But actually, it starts, I think, in the classroom, you know, and, 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 and this notion that we could we can grab the imagination of a young child, uh, um, you know, and all this sort of stuff that Ken talks about, the person who walks, you know, on their hands. <laughs> we um, have the ability, I think, in the schools, uh, um, and with some amazing sort of uh, inspiring sort of teachers um, to set people on a kind of a path. And uh, once again, I suppose we've been fortunate to put on in the infrastructure, you know, because of Ken's work on the Unlocking Creativity um, Strategy with yourself, Aiden, way back 20 years ago, where uh, we were able to establish um, in 2003 creative learning centers in Derry and Belfast and in Armagh as well too, um, an independent one that runs there um, with the Education Authority directly, with the nerve centers, one in Belfast and Derry, I suppose is slightly independent of, of the sort of system. But the training of teachers, you know, um, uh, the preparation of people for a, a sort of a digital world, I think in some, in some senses, uh, you, you know, it may have taken co the COVID crisis, they sort of bring it home to people that if you don't, uh, uh, if you aren't fully engaged in this digital world, you're completely and utterly left behind. And that would be my, I suppose, just parting um, message around and imagine if that, um, uh, you know, my imagine would be obviously that out of COVID now, to come out the other end of COVID, that lesson would be well and truly learned that if you don't, um, um, uh, you know, pick up the digital shovels, the digital tools, and really use them sort of in the most creative way as Ken obviously has, out, has, has got outlined and nearly everything he ever says, that's what he's kind of saying is about digital connectivity and the way that, uh, uh, you know, in a sense you can, you can change lives, you can transform sort of whole societies. Um, and hopefully that maybe that, that, that's what the lesson of COVID will be. That, that was brilliant, Marty, again. And I, I mean, Creative Mavericks is such a concept. That's what I think we're seeing. And that we uh, something that will allow us to all be creative mag um, mavericks. But your point about picking up the digital tools is the imagine if uh, makes such perfect sense in the current context. And indeed, again, that leads me in really well into Noel. And Noel McAlinden um, it would be known to many in the city, but Noel was the woman who happened to have a copy of All Our Futures in the boot of her car. Um, when I was uh, the weekend, I was going home to read all our futures, which from which we went to unlocking creativity, um, and which Marty has again was there from the outset. So Noel is someone who has taught uh, across schools, colleges, universities, and in the prison sector, and was the advisory officer in the Western Education Library Board at the time, and was thankfully given to the City of Culture. Um, uh, team uh, on secondment for the duration of the 20, 2013 uh, year and, and indeed either side of it and was such a fundamental support um, in the development and delivery. The London Street Gallery in particular was a good example of where she just used her own creative creativity. She's an arts, an artist herself, a curator, an arts act activist. So we couldn't have had today without having someone like Noel who just personifies indeed that creative maverick piece. Um, and Noel, without further ado, again, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. Um, 
Hello? Yeah, can you? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So um, thank you very much, Aidan. That's a lovely introduction. I hope I live up to the expectation. Um, I'm actually sitting in front of a picture that I painted um, after meeting Ken Robinson over 20 years ago. And um, at that time, he was writing his book, Out of Our Minds, and I was preparing for an exhibition, Out of the Blue, of which Aidan opened. And it's a reminder for me about nurturing the child inside all of us. Um, my background is in education. I, I, I trained as an, art, as an art and design teacher, and I worked in schools and college, university, and the prison sector. And um, I've had so many, many opportunities that I, that I have been really, truly blessed. And the people that have inspired me in my life, among many, have been my teachers as early as you know, uh, primary school. Um, I, I know that we spend a lifetime looking for our tribe and to find our purpose and passion can be a destination that no, none of us will ever get there to. And I can remember with great relish the first time that I met Ken Robinson speak um, at an event in Stranmillis College, and it was his presentation of all our futures. He was addressing an audience of educators, of arts, or, of arts um, uh, managers, and cultural organizations. And the delivery of his message, which was his presentation of all our futures, was as poignant and as passionate as the content that he actually mentioned. We felt we had found our, found our tribe, not only our tribe, but we'd found our leader and we'd found our mentor. And you can imagine the relish in which we, we, we worked when we were invited to participate on the Unlocking Creativity Agenda, which was the, the unlocking the potential of the people and place across the whole of um, Northern Ireland. And um, on that day that I was coming back, I took two copies. I always believe that get one and then give one away. And on the way back, I met Aideen in Sprucefield and I handed over the copy. And I just felt so passionately about the importance of that document, but also the importance of the message and how fortunate then a number of us, our colleagues and those involved in the arts and cultural sector were to be part of that unlocking creativity strategy. It was an extension of our tribe. We were committed and dedicated and connected to really, I suppose, making sure that creativity was there, not just exclusively the, the remit of the arts, but wider and further afield. And with Aideen's vision to, to deliver and, and develop this idea of bringing Ken back to inform not just one government department, but four government departments. And like Marty, we have seen the manifestation of that document in so many different ways. I know I, I, I in a personal as well as a professional capacity, owe so much to Ken and his thinking and his vision, but also so many generations of children and um, our professionals and our educators. And I suppose to the point that they, our educators are not exclusively our teachers. Our teachers are fundamentally part of that. But we've seen during COVID and during lockdown that our educators come in all shapes and sizes. And for me, the key point as well is about lifelong learning. I taught in prim primary, post-primary, college, university, and in the prison sector. And the oldest student I had was an 83-year-old ex-Japanese prisoner of war who was as, pa as passionate about learning as he was, I'm sure, when he was much, much younger. It was his way out of and went through challenges, losses and gains, bereavements and reincarnations. And for me, it was a real lesson and a real privilege then to join the team that were part of the, 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 the huge tribe that delivered the um, the the first UK city of culture for Derry, London Derry. And um, part of that, I suppose, induction was working on the, the one plan and the stakeholder engagement piece. And as Marty and Aidan and Jennifer have said, the importance of working with and connecting to all of the, uh, the, um, the communities, the individuals, the cultural champions, and to, in a region and a city that was rich with cultural and creative activity um, was really, really uh, powerful to witness. Um, to actually witness so many ways in which we could see artists as catalysts, as change makers, to recognize the creative within ourselves and within each other, and to look at the reclaiming of spaces and places in a completely different way. One of the many initiatives that I know was a direct response from the Unlocking Creativity Agenda was the, was the Creative Youth Partnerships model of placing artists and writers and performers and creatives in youth settings from early years, early years right up to the age of 25. I know that all of my colleagues across the Education Authority and our five development officers were a crucial part of the success and working in partnership was the only way that we could have delivered that. Um, obviously in partnership with BCAL, with, the, with uh, the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, but also with the communities, with the businesses, with the individuals and the artists themselves and also our educationalists. 
In the context of the city of culture, I have to say it was one of the highlights of my professional and personal life um, because of the friendships, because of the partnerships, but because most of all, we exceeded and excelled all of our expectations. Ken talked about Rio you know, imagining, imagining a future that we can't even you know, touch yet. And to, to be part of that event 10 years ago was something, again, that was very, very special. To be part of that team that facilitated Ken's visit to the city um, to, to not just inform an education system, but transform it, to give us courage, to give us encouragement, to give us um, you know, his, his time and his generosity was hugely significant. And not just to the, all the people that sat in that room at that particular time, there were other opportunities to meet with principals and senior leaders to ignite that creative spark that Marty talks about with the Pushkin Trust um, and the late Duchess of, of Abercorn and the whole idea of, you know, this creative spirit and investing in our educators and giving them the status that they deserve. And it's really, really important. I noticed Ken McCrummish's comment there, a colleague from the Education Authority. I wonder if Ken saw how, how creative and innovative our teachers were trying to be now in really, really challenging circumstances. You know, this void that we find ourselves in, people talk about we're in this storm together. I'm not so sure. I don't think we're all in the same boat. I think some of the vessels aren't even worthy of floating. And I would agree with, with Marty wholeheartedly. We need to address the infrastructure. We need to look at the, this digital literacy, which is the new literacy, more important than anything else, I think. And we need to ensure we equip and empower and support not just our children and young people to thrive and, but, but, um, and beyond survival, but also our older generation as well. We've seen the role of grandparents. We've seen the, the role of lifelong learning. The fact that, that Derry London Derry is now a learning city and joined a network of, of over 200 learning cities is really, really significant. The city and region has shown its commitment to lifelong learning. The investment in the universities, the connections and the partnerships across the learning cities, or the learning um, uh, communities. And I do recall uh, as part of, of Ken's visit, we talked about this idea of the creative campus, this idea of linking and connecting educators in the broadest sense, in the community sector, in the school and university and college sector, but also looking at lifelong learning. And for me, and, and for the, the uh, for in particular to see the, the city rewarded and acknowledged for its learning city status is really, really important. And the fact that it delivered the first ever virtual learning study against all of the odds during the, the pandemic is something that to be really proud of. I, I find myself excited, even though this is a really, really challenging time because of the possibilities and because of our abilities connected to work together and, and to reimagine a future, to, to reflect on Ken's visit here, uh, not just his visit, but his visits, his ongoing contribution has been li a lifelong commitment over 20 years. And we have gained and gleaned from that experience through his TED Talks, through his personal connections, through his, his um, encouragement, his wit and his humour, but most of all his legacy, which is a living legacy. And I feel really, really strongly that creativity, self-expression is going to be a salve for all of us during this particular time. We need healthy people, we need mentally astute. We need young people and their elders, as well as all of the generations in between, to feel that they are healthy and well, and not, not gripped by fear about what, what's next. We have a huge role to play, I believe, in motivating people back into learning in a, in a, in a different context. We have teachers who feel fractured and fragile. We have schools that are ill-equipped. We have communities that have a will and a way and the dedication to do something really, really special and really powerful, but we need to work together. For me, there are so many ways that we have witnessed that firsthand. The, the Northern Ireland strategy, the Unlocking Creativity strategy, the, the City of Culture um, regional commitment and the subsequent legacy, the partnerships, the programmes. We currently have a programme for government out for consultation and a health strategy. It's not a case of one or the other. We need to do this together and we are stronger by working together. And I, I do believe strongly that there is a father shore that is reachable from here. And I do believe we have already embraced the miracles, the curious and the healing wells. Wonderful. Thank you so much. What a panel of speakers. Um, we're down to the last few minutes. Um, as always, these things could go on for hours. 
but I think the richness of what we've heard from all the panel, um, to sum up, imagine if um, the, the, the quote that we had um, is, you know, I, and I think we've heard this this morning, Ken said, I get it, I love it, I want it, where is it? Um, and if you're not prepared to be wrong, you never come up with anything original. I mean, I think that's just been what we've seen this morning. And Kate, um, moving over to you now, we're just so, so privileged, genuinely, um, to see you take on your father's legacy. And we heard him talking about James in, in the video. And I know from it from the book, I love, I haven't, we probably haven't time, I could go on for hours about you know his love for you and your mum. And we're so privileged that you as the family have allowed us to have today um, in, in his honour. Um, and, you know, one of the things I wanted to say was a quote I chose for you, because I think that we all need to take it on board, um, which should come up on the screen, hopefully. Uh, for Kate, I'll read it. If you look in the eyes of your children or those you care for, and rather than approaching them with a template about who they might be, try to understand who they really are. I think that's just what we've heard this morning. And Kate, you're the personification of that. You're your you are your father's daughter and he should be so proud. And indeed, in the chat box, somebody said, Ken must be up there dancing. And during that, the sun was beaming down on me. So I just feel that he was with us um, and he is with us. And even more so because you're going to say a few words for us now to tell us how um, we're going to continue his legacy. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so much, Aideen. Um... It's funny, Dad mentioned James in the first TED talk, and you'll notice he mentions me in the second, and that was not coincidental. That was the four years in between of me harassing him. I'm not even sure if the story told's true or not, but um, but I'm in there. The um, the, this has just been incredible. I mean, it, it's uh, for me to to hear everything that everyone's been talking about. Um, Jennifer, that wall behind you is amazing. You're going to have to tell me who the artist is so that we can get one for ourselves here because it's just beautiful um, and I should say by the way I've been slightly creeping in the background the whole time I didn't know if I should put my camera on so I've been I've, I've listened to absolutely everything um I think what the biggest takeaway that I've had from watching this um and listening to you all speak is the dairy and that experience really is a living and breathing legacy of everything that dad talked about it's such um such a shining example of what happens when people john as you said are in their element when they're working together and that was the other superpower that dad said that humans have aside from imagination was the, the collaboration you know and in schools we talk about competition constantly but actually what happens when we collaborate um and you know to to hear today about the collaboration that happened with Derry and to really um just look at what happens as you've all talked about when the when the conditions are created it it's it's all the evidence we need isn't it you know if we needed any more of it anyway um so it's just i'm adine i'm blown away by all of this um, and listening to you all speak this morning and 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 hearing all of your imaginative statements have been incredible which is you know dad talked in that session he did in Derry 10 years ago about imagination and that quote about how you know, we can't predict the future, but we can help to create it. And that's what we're trying to do with Imagine If. It's inspired by by his commitment to our powers of imagination. Um, he talked about how we don't live in the world as other creatures do. We create the worlds in which we live. And we do that through our power of imagination. And certainly, you know, as everyone's touched on a bit this morning as well, the difficulties that we're facing uh, because of COVID and because of Brexit and because we are where we are at this point in history, um, the time has come to really take stock of the the aspects of life that aren't serving us and to recreate them, to reimagine them. Um, there's another really beautiful quote from dad that he put in one of his introductions for Out of Our Minds, which was, the more complex the challenges of the world become, the more creative our solutions must be to overcome them. Um, and I think that that's what, you know, Derry, the city of culture really lived and breathed and that that's what we're hoping. So I think we've got so much to learn from the experience and it's just been, it's just been incredible hearing everybody speak this morning. So thank you. Aideen, you're on mute, I think. 
Thank you, Kate. Thank you. I did well all day. I did well all day. Somebody said that on mute is the new 2021 in the chat box. And I know that there's some people feel there's there's different voices in there who too feel that maybe we have let things go and we didn't get the legacy. But I think from this morning, what we've all learned is that it's there. It's there for us in the taking. Um, just a couple of final quotes. And we were going to finish with a very short soundbite from Ken. Um, who just continues to inspire and Kate anything we can do um, to support you in his legacy work um, do you want to say about the Imagine F festival do you want to mention that to people in case they'd be interested in um, because this hopefully will feature on that it will definitely it will feature so the um, I can of course the festival is happening next week um, from March 1st to 4th um, although if you're watching this during the festival, it's happening right now. So thank you for joining us. Um, it's dad's birthday would be March the 4th. So that's that's um, the events and celebration of him and his life. Um, you know, it's a coming together, not because he died, but because he lived and because we all have work to do to continue his message and to move forward. Um, so it's a provocation to reimagine the world that we take for granted. And um, the first to the third, there'll be events like this, which are just amazing. And then on the fourth, uh, we've got rather long stream um got slightly carried away with ourselves <laughs> so we've got i think about 12 hours worth of content for the fourth um which will which will be in his channels so if you follow at we imagine if on twitter or instagram and the website's we dash imagine no it's not it's not at all ignore that it's www.imagine.if.com i'll put it in the chat Perfect. <laughs> that's, be Perfect. that's what I was going to say because I'd say a lot of people will want to will want to tune in, and we are honoured to be on the platform on the fringe of it. Of it. It's fabulous that we are. And um, just to finish, because we're literally we're already over time slightly, um, but I just wanted to finish with this clip from Ken, and just to say that the the last quote actually sums up what you said. He told us to make the best of our time together on this small and crowded planet. This is his quote. Uh, we have to develop consciously and rigorously our powers of imagination and creativity within a different framework of human purpose. And I think now this present time we're in is, is right for us. My imaginif, because so much that's coming in is about young people and new generations and inspiring and unlocking, that he said each of us individually and all of us together need and I've, I'm going to put in can uh, rediscover instead of discover our element. And I think that's what today was about. Everybody that spoke was inspiring. Um, thank you for the feedback. Continue to give it to us. And we finish with Ken's last word from his video on my thoughts for the call to unite. So thank you, everybody. Want to create ahead of us. You know, we are deeply creative creatures. Although we are like the rest of life on Earth, there's one key respect in which we are different. The difference is that we have boundless capacities for innovation, imagination, and creativity. You know, we don't live in the world as other creatures do. We should live in the world as they do more than we have done. But there is this difference that we've always created ideas about the world. We have languages through which we express our feelings and communicate with each other about the world. We create works of art, scientific theories, philosophies. We create, in a word, cultures. And our cultures define us in more ways often than we can really see uh, openly or suspect. The world is full of diverse cultures, diverse ways of seeing. That is true, but we also have common interests. We have a common set of, of fortunes to confront. We are a single species with other species on one planet. And as we get back to normal, we need to reimagine what that could look like and to learn the lessons of this lockdown, to learn the lessons of the pandemic, to see beyond them and to create a new sort of world and a new kind of normal. There is an opportunity. It takes bravery and imagination, and we have plenty of that in store. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.